Are you king? Nanit Vuyum Equanimich Asgard Hobbies. Nanit Vuyum Kyle. Piata Um. This video will be a continuation of part one infantry tactics, uh, only instead of doing conventional army like we did in the first one, we're going to do unconventional forces such as Native Americans and light infantry. Quick disclaimer before I get into the video, uh, the term Native American Indian has caused some slight problems, and as I explained in the first one, I am not going to take time to say every tribe mentioned in the uh, Seven Years War, also known as the French and Indian War, or the Revolutionary War, or the Civil War. I um, My weapons may be incorrect, my uniform or clothing at the time may be incorrect. Another disclaimer is I am a Native American. And I would rather be called Native American or Indian versus Savage or Barbarian. So, with that out of the way... Let's get into the video. Yo, toi. against colonials, usually against other colonials and native tribes. <clears throat> they fought against native tribes as a means to keep their territory or to recapture territory. And they fought against colonials or colonists as a means to keep colonial authority from taking their lands and being subjugated to colonial rule. Native Americans would fight, well, start out as British military, colonial military, and the U.S. government from King Philip's War in 1675 till the Battle of Bear Creek in 1918. But these are some of the weapons they used. Though this is not historically accurate, it is historically appropriate. This is a polythane club with a metal spike from cold steel. <clears throat> Used by natives for 200 to 300 years, used mostly by the Woodland and Plains tribes around the Great Lakes area and northeast, it would gradually be replaced in the 19th century by tomahawks. Another one is a gunstock war club. It would take place in the same area, but it would be more relatively new. There is actually debate whether or not uh, this could be used for an actual musket. The answer is no. The wood's too thin into this area. So after so many shots, it would just splinter and explode. <clears throat> used by the uh, Northeast Plain Tribes in the 17th and 19th century. Um, there are actually a couple debates on its design. Some think it was influenced by European rifles. <sighs> such as the Kentucky rifle here that I have. Or it's quite possible that it was an independent design. But these two will eventually be phased out by tomahawks. Uh, right here we have a tomahawk. Used during the French and Indian War. It would see usage on frontier wars. Um, expanding west. These were more than likely traded for or captured during war. These replaced the stone tomahawks, 
and over time, it gradually metal will replace all Native American weaponry from tomahawks, knives, even arrowheads. Right here is a stone knife or a prismic blade. And deer antler tied together with sinew and a piece of turquoise in the handle. These would see usage for years. <clears throat> I have another one in my notes. Give me a sec. I know I'm forgetting one. Alright, so, I have another one. It's not historically accurate, but it's historically appropriate. Bow and arrow we, would be used in the North American area for about 1,400 years around the late woodlands. <clears throat> in fact, bows were considered to be a very magical and powerful weapon. It was a symbol of a warrior's status. So these were some of the weapons they'd use against the colonists, other than, you know, muskets and pistols. Native Americans, however, would also deploy a psychological tactic in the form of scalping. In fact, earlier French settlers have recorded seeing Native Americans in the 1500s scalp other Native Americans, but it was during the French and Indian War that the British would drastically encourage this as a means to collect bounties on fallen French soldiers. Now. There was another form of warfare that Native Americans never had, but quickly adapted to, and it was warfare on horseback. Horses are not native to America. In fact, they come from Spain. And the English and Spanish wanted keeping the horse a secret from the Native Americans, would not teach them anything about them. But it was through observation and imitation that Native Americans eventually learned how to fight, hunt, and ride on horseback. Let's go into some of the tactics. Now you have to remember the problem with ambush tactics is superior numbers will beat superior tactics. Because if you don't have enough manpower to make your tactic work, then you don't have enough firepower to repel the enemy. And if this truly was the case of superior tactics beats all, well then we would have we would have uh, we wouldn't have lost the Vietnam War and we wouldn't have lost the Afghan War. So if a guy if 500 guys in sandals and AKs can beat 50 trained soldiers. That's just proof right there that superior numbers beats superior tactics. So, let's get into some of the tactics. Conventional armies were used to fighting each other in conventional ways. As you can see, we have artillery lining the hill, which would fire upon either the cavalry that's about to charge the artillery, or they would soften up the infantry before engaging their infantry. The average engagement distance for infantry is anywhere from 80 to 100 meters, or 240 to 300 feet. And the only reason, if I think I said this before in my uh, artillery episode, the only reason why artillery would ever engage artillery is if their artillery was doing more damage to their infantry. So seeing how we have orange artillery here on the ground, their range isn't as far as the artillery on the hill. So it's likely that while this, while this artillery battery is engaging infantry, they will more than likely take their focus off the infantry and engage the artillery. We have cavalry here, as I've mentioned before, going to swarm the artillery, unaware of the cavalry waiting. So the moment they hear a change in rhythm such as drums or maybe they hear a trumpet on the hill letting them know that they're about to be attacked these cavalry more than likely come out and engage the enemy cavalry and this is a traditional conventional way that Europeans would wage warfare however um, the Native Americans would wage warfare in an unconventional method Right here we have unconventional Native American forces, green, and a very conventional European army, the orange. Uh, this gentleman's yellow because he's in charge of this uh, foot regiment, and this is an artillery unit. 
As you can see already, when it started, they lost two people, more than likely to one of the two people on the hillsides. You know, most ambushes are conducted during the daytime. One third of all ambushes occur during the morning hours, in which troops are moving out from their base, conducting daily operations, such as patrols, or as you can see, because of the artillery unit, they're transferring artillery from one point to another point. Ah. An ambush on average is joined at anywhere from 12 to 20 meters or 36 to 60 feet. Uh, this range is actually to prevent the enemy from using superior firepower or supporting fire or even suppressive fire. Ambushes were most frequent upon roads, trails, streams. What makes ambushes successful is your knowledge of the terrain your maneuverability, how quick you can move around, and then of course, the surprise of violence or action. So, <clears throat> Native Americans, after they would fire the first volley, which, you know, how in the European school was, okay, I fire, reload, and at that time, the other armies firing and then reloading, and it was whoever can reload and fire the fastest won. What made this irritating for Europeans is after the Native Americans would fire they would rush the regiment and then basically beat them to death with melee weapons. Right, so this is a roadside ambush because it's on a roadside. We're going to do a couple more ambushes and it more or less is all going to be the same. They're going to the, in, the unconventional force is going to fire, and then once they get the first shot off, they're going to rush in for melee. Okay, right here we have an L-shaped ambush. We have the unconventional Native American forces behind some bushes, which is concealment. We have them on top of a rock ledge, which is also, well, it's, it's both concealment and cover. And then we have four behind a log, which is cover. Now, the important thing to remember between concealment and cover is concealment is anything that's going to mask your movement or just, you know, interrupt your the vision between you and the enemy. Well, cover is actually going is what is going to stop the projectile going through you. So here we again, we have a small column of infantry, a small group of artillery, and it's remember the roles. It is the infantry's job to engage the enemy, and it's the artillerymen's job to protect the gun. So more than likely what would happen is this front row here would pop up from behind their log, fire into the column, lay down, and while they're trying to figure out what's happening, the side row here would also fire. The group of five here, can you see the map? Yeah, the group of five here more than likely charge the artillerymen and then go into the infantrymen. And while that's happening, these three here would get off their rock, these four here would come out from over the log and charge the infantrymen. Because it is speed, maneuver maneuverability, and surprise of violence or action that makes ambushes effective. Knowledge of terrain also gives you a serious edge. So this is an L-shaped ambush. I'm gonna introduce one more. And then I'm just going to try to explain more modern ambushes because I don't think these would have happened during the revolution. I'm not 100% sure. But, <clears throat> so let's go into the next one. This right here is a U-shaped ambush, if it wasn't apparent, because it's shaped like a U. And similar to the L-shaped ambush, and more than likely it would be the same thing. The front five here will pop up, shoot into the infantry column, Lay down, because while they're returning fire, the sides would also fire. We got seven on the rock side, which more than likely would fire into the infantry column. And then we got six along the trees, five along the bushes. So these would either, this would, you know, divide their fire. Some of them will fire into the artillerymen, some of them will fire into the infantrymen. And if there's anyone left, they would rush and kill them. We're going to go over one more possible ambush. 
And then we're gonna get into some modern ambush tactics along with, you know, how to identify the possibility of there being an ambush and ambush withdraw tactics as we know it. Here we have a V sheep ambush. It's also a lure and ambush. Because as you can see here, these four don't belong in any particular group. At the same time, this one is facing towards the infantrymen. We also have two unconventional forces killed. We also have three conventional forces killed. Now how the lure and ambush works is pretty much what you think. So these six all jumped out of nowhere, fired into the column. Unfortunately, they only managed to kill six and then ran causing the, what was left of the group to chase them into an, am an ambush here with these eight in waiting. And then of course now once these eight fire into the infantry group, there will be less of them and then they will all turn around and charge in for the melee. All right, so we're gonna do, it's a modern ambush tactic. I think it's taught in the Marines. And it's possible. I didn't find a lot of research on how Native Americans conducted ambushes, so I'm just doing in my mind what I think makes the most sense. All right, so next ambush. Here we have a Z shape or Z shape for my European viewers. Now, if I was to ask you between the infantrymen and their commander, the cavalrymen and their commander, which group was more dangerous and therefore you need to focus your fire the most on? What group will you say? I'll give you five seconds. All right, the answer is cavalry. Now, what makes cavalry more dangerous than infantry is cavalry can shoot you off horseback, they can ride past you, slash you with their swords, or they can just simply run you over with the horse, therefore making cavalry more dangerous than infantry in this condition. So, these four here, can yeah, these four here more than likely will focus their fire into the cavalry unit, leaving the remaining six here to focus their fire into the infantry unit. And then, once again, once they're done firing, they would drop their weapons, or at least their muskets, and then charge in with melee weapons. These four back here in the mountain are in charge of delaying any reinforcements should they come. Like, say you're close, you, you think you're too close to an enemy base or camp, and you're afraid that what's going on here will cause them to send reinforcements. So that's why these are these four are right here. To so harass the enforcements and keep them as delayed as po as long as possible. And should they fail, they'd give a signal letting you know, hey, we need to go. So let me find my little green book. And I'm going to read to you the types of dispersion and explain them as best as I can, as well as indicators of an ambush. Okay, so we're going to start with indicators of an ambush. One of them is tie down brush. This could be a possible fire line. Let's say if you have this bush here and it's all, you know, bushy as it should. But for some weird reason, the tops, the top branches or the side branches seem like they're being pulled back or have been bent forward. You know, things that aren't natural with the exception of maybe like in a urban environment. That could be an indicator of a firing line, meaning there could be people behind that bush waiting to pop out and sh um, well, what do people in an ambush do? They shoot at you. Another one could be empty towns, camps, or villages, a way to lure enemies in closer. Like you go, have, let's think about this. Okay, uh, for those who've seen uh, Dances with Wolves, it's like close to the end, or it's like maybe the middle of the movie. When the Pawnee move into the Sioux village, they're, they, it looks abandoned, so they start investigating, they start looking around, and then they get attacked all of a sudden. That's an example of an empty town camp or village ambush. Another one would be animals or crops in areas that they shouldn't be. Let's say you've been hiking and you've done this for years so you know what trail to take and you know about two and a half miles in there's a stream. 
Well, let's say you get to that stream and you look up across from you, you see a camp that's not supposed to be there, it hasn't been there in all the time you've been walking that trail, and now you're being shot at. Because that camp's not where it should have been, and because you stumbled upon them, it's led to, well, problems. Another one's a high activity in all places, so just think back to the previous example I just gave, you know, You've been hiking a trail, you know, two and a half miles in, you go two and a half miles into the stream, and you see, you know, what looks like cut grass, trees cut down, branches trimmed, like someone's setting up there. That could be a sign of an ambush or a possible campsite for them to enact an ambush. Steady drop-offs or resupplies to a location. Now, this one's just... Think of it like a mailman, but in reverse. So let's say, you know, if the mailman delivers you mail every day, okay, that's just normal. And he starts delivering once a week. Okay, that's a little strange. And now it's once a month. Okay, that's very strange. Now it's not of all. That would be weird. Well, this one is the reverse. You know, you go to a spot, you know, there's nothing there. And then all of a sudden things start being there once a month. Now it's once a week. Now it's every day. So someone... Well, someone is dropping stuff off and someone else is picking stuff up. That could be a sign of possible ambush. And then sniper fire or harassing fire, which we talked about in the lure, uh, lure and ambush. You know, someone's shooting at you, so you go to chase them and next thing you know, you're surrounded. Possible um, withdrawal t tactics is fragmenting. Okay, so... Uh, fragmenting is when a group or individuals break into multiple directions on a set path and then run view to a planned location. So let's say after the ambush and things aren't going right, this group here will take off right. The group in the tree line will take off at a 35 degree, 135 degree direction. And the group on the hillside after coming down will take off left. That would be fragmenting. Uh, dispersing as a means to make yourself lighter so you'll drop everything you don't need like you drop your backpack possibly one of your weapons and then you just again take off either right 135 left depending on what uh, path you were designated to take now hiding hiding is pretty simple this is where you would use concealment like you'd hide behind a bush jump possibly in a hole or using a cave network that you know the enemy doesn't know about or you hope the enemy doesn't know about or just, you know, jump in a stream and hold your breath underwater. Uh, this, now then there's deceiving or delaying. Now let's say uh, the group in the tree line decided they were going to delay or deceive the enemy. So they'd fire into the group and continue firing while well, this group takes off, you know, completely behind them and this group does comes down goes left. And once they feel the group's far enough away, they would disperse or possibly fragment and be taking their six-man group and making it a three-man group and then go 135 or somehow run behind the enemy and continue right. So that's some dispersing tactics, some ambush tactics, and as well as indicators of an ambush. Okay, a bit of a hang fire um, and you want to troubleshoot. Uh, but before you troubleshoot, or before you even load it, make sure there's no blockage in the uh, baluster or in the touch hole area. And you can do that by blowing into the barrel, and you should hear air. Or if you put your finger above it, you should feel air on your finger. So we'll pull this into half cock, show you that it's not loaded. Not loaded. You should hear air coming through. Okay, I feel air. All right, so there's nothing blocking it. But let's say, you know, for some weird reason, you put, the fire in the, you put powder in the pan, you fire, but it's not going off. Okay, so you just, you do it again, you fire, and it's still not going off. So what you want to do is you want to take your lock off. You want to remove this one completely, but this one you can leave in. You just have to back it out because it holds the uh, ramrod spring that keeps the ramrod from falling out. You want a tool like this, which I got from Traditions, or you can just bring a screwdriver with you. So we're gonna back this out. All right, 
Now we're going to take this one out completely. Then you want to rock your uh, lock loose. Right here is your touch hole. So taking a paper clip or a sewing needle or just you can buy uh, touch hole picks from either Midway USA, which is where I get most of my uh, black powder and black powder accessories. You can also get a more traditional, and I mean that traditional, style pick from um, the Quartermaster General. So take your pick, go through the touch hole, okay? So it's going through the touch hole just fine, so maybe it's not in the touch hole. So take your touch hole screw off. So maybe it's in your baluster or bolster. Keep forgetting how it's pronounced. Be the mirror. So it goes, there's a cavity here and then turns to a small hole this way which, you know, goes into the barrel, which widens out again, because that's how it builds pressure. So, try to get it as best of an angle as you can. And then, because there's nothing in here, it's going through. Well, as far as it can, anyway. So, okay, so now that's clear. So, it's possible that maybe when you rammed your cartridge home, that the powder didn't get into the baluster pan, or bolster pan. So, you might have to take a little bit of powder... And it's not recommended you do this because it, if there's an ember still lingering in there, it could catch it and fire the weapon. So be careful. Make sure you know there's nothing in there or as best as you can. So add a little extra powder to the baluster. Put your touch hole back on. I mean, once you got done picking it, of course, just to be sure, put powder in, then put your touch hole back on. Put your lock back on. So you don't accidentally cut yourself. Pull this back. Pull the cock back. Engage the trigger. Let it come forward. That keeps it from accidentally cutting yourself. Tighten your ramrod screw. Well, yeah, ramrod spring lock screw. All right, so at this stage, you want to perform a function check. So pull the cock and half cock, close the pan, do not add any powder. All right, so that worked fine. Now let's see you were to fire it. And this is under spring tension from the spring here, so we'll just bring that forward. Second trigger. All right, so that made it. So yeah, that works now. Now you can put it back in half cock, prime the pan, close the frizzin. And you should be able to go. Here we have our lock. Put that to half cock. Get that out. There's our lock. Take the back end of your cartridge, rip that off. And I sprinkle just a little bit of powder in there. Close the pan, take the barrel, point it up, and then you just dump the rest of the cartridge. Remove your ramrod, send it home. Return your ramrod. All right, now let's go ambush that water cooler.
Here we have our target set up. It's played by that unfortunate cooler. We're going to conduct an L-shaped ambush, and that'll probably be the only ambush we do today. And then we're going to um, shooting off horseback again. And you know, I said earlier that horses aren't native to America. The Greek word for horse is yurastishi, which when translated means large dog. Because if you had to describe a horse, you know, some, if you had to describe a horse in terms of something you know everyone has seen, you'd probably say large dog. All right, so let's load up the flintlock. All right, so here we are back at the same location as last time, only I have you facing away from the sun. I might have to move the camera when I go to actually do the conduct the ambush, but let's load up again. Half cock. Paper cartridge, bite off the back. Sprinkle into the pan. Close. Keep it aloft or off the ground. Pour the remainder into the bore. Remove ramrod. Send home. Remove ramrod. Return. Fingers out. As you can see here, it is away from the barrel, and that's how the uh, manual says you should load a musket, or in my case, a rifle. All right, let's set up the target and try the ambush again. Here's an alternate way to load a flintlock. You you know, for some reason, not be a fan of quick, easy cartridges. I have a brass tube full of 4F powder. One plunge. Close the frizzin. Plunge it again. Let it plunge it once more. Pre-made powder measure, so pre-measured powder measure. Patches. Shot. Full cock, second trigger. All right, here we are as the target set up. Now, remember in the cavalry video how there was a cavalry draw? Well, in the earlier periods, there was a cavalry grip. You'd hold the pistol slightly like this, so the powder seated against the touch hole. So when you fired, it had a better chance of going off. But problem is with flintlock and wind coming, there's a good chance that when I squeeze the trigger, it may not go off at all. It might spark, and it might see smoke, but it may not go off. The other problem is, this is a right-handed lock for a right-handed person. Unfortunately, I have to do this left-handed, so which means I'll be shooting across from myself, getting smoke in my face. But when I come back around, hopefully you'll see me transition pistols. Never mind, just one target. So, let's load these. So, here I have a 50 caliber ball for my 50 caliber pistol. Same thing with the rifle, you're gonna bite off the back. Dump a little into the frizzin. I didn't bite it off enough. And then put the rest down the bore. And 
So that's one ready to go. Second one, we're gonna take powder from the priming flask. Grab a patch and shot. Powder. Wad, bowl, bowl starter, seat it the rest of the way. All right, let's go. So as you saw with two pistols, one went off, but I missed. The second one, I squeezed the trigger. It sparked, but nothing happened. But Native Americans would not only shoot off horseback using the grip they've learned from uh, Europeans, they would also throw tomahawks off their horses, as you will see in this next clip of me throwing a tomahawk off my horse. So, with all that, let's see if I can hit the balloon from here. Nope, right next to it, however. All right, let's finish this video at home. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. If you have any suggestions or criticisms, leave a comment. And if you want to stay tuned for my next project, don't forget to click that subscribe icon and ring that bell. So, until our next project, have a beautiful day.